Hello guys, welcome to the unofficial North podcast. I'm Trusty, your host, and my co-host Marcus. Hey. And we have a special guest with us, Joshua Griffin. Tell us, Griffin, Joshua, have you like, who are you? Where are you from? And what do you do? Are you? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I'm Josh. I've uh, been working in the well. I started my teaching in London in a place called Ravensbourne. Worked there for about three or four years, and then came to Norway. I lost a bet, and then started teaching in Norof. That wasn't part of the lost bet. Um, and I, I think I've been here for about eight years now. I think. I think it's eight years. Eight years. I think so. Eight years of teaching and. I'm terrible. I forget my age, so I'm not. I'm not sure. I think it's yeah, seven or eight. Twenty-eight, right? Uh, may I ask <laughs> where are you from? Uh, in like from in England? Any like, sure. specific? Uh, quite a few specific places. So um, I, I grew up a little bit in Manchester. That's where I started. But then I, my family moved around the UK quite a lot. Mm. Um, we weren't fugitives, but we we moved every six to twelve months. Uh, and I think I spent most of my time in Somerset and did some you, early years in Oxford. Did you um, study like game development? Because to declare we are all ga game students and we are studying game development or interactive media at Norof. Uh, did you uh, get your education in the UK? I did some of it. Um, so I did some uh, art. Um, education when I was younger. Um, I went to Chelsea Art School to do painting. Uh, ended up doing stop motion instead of painting in that course. And then uh, went to New Zealand for a bit to do a film course. Um, so I picked up some film studies there. And that's that's when I kind of fell in with 3D um, generally. And that was actually 3D animation. And I did an animation degree in London. Oh. Um, and I, I started again to subvert the course and handed in some some games work for it instead of animation. So you fell in love with game development, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Did you learn a code? Of course. Did Sorry, you learn to code just on your own from that? Yeah. I mean, with with games, you mean, or oh, with code? Sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I taught myself coding, so I taught myself uh, Unity script, like JavaScript. Um, mm -hmm. In the early days, uh, I made our finals were generally in that course, uh, like a, a 3D animation. You'd make a short film or some other element. And I made a game instead with uh, an animated helicopter coming in and a character jumping off. And then you'd, you'd go around some mines and uh, there was a jumping puzzle and cutscenes. And it was way too big. But I did that all in JS. It was thin, flimsy, and bug ridden. But... Did you manage to finish it? It yeah, it, it, in some states yeah. yeah. Damn. Uh, the well, elevator, the elevator like... was the hardest part. Getting getting a character on an elevator and coding that yourself and having them fly off hundreds of meters <laughs> that was uh, entertaining. And when was when was that when you did that, that project? Twenty thirteen. Is that ten years ago back now? Yeah. Yeah. I I feel like um, game development back in the day was so much grind, you know. Like just <laughs> teaching yourself like how to like code and understand Unity and all that. Were there any like major interactive media studies or bachelor projects that were available back then, like compared to now? Or has the Sorry. industry Sorry. like has the interest industry like I feel like the was the accessibility to become a game designer as um great as of now? Like the um, like when you want to become a game designer back in the day, like 2008, I felt like it was so much of grind. Um, is it, do you feel like it has um, exploded in the past couple of years, accessibility? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think it, in terms of the workload or like what you do or what we're expected to do, I think it's pretty much the same. That as as our tools, this is something that will probably crop up a bit, a bit during our conversation. But as our tools get better, we kind of just fill in the work. So uh, mm -hmm. it's not that the tools replace the work; it's that we have to work harder to um, to to kind of keep up, really. But 
in in terms of the job market, I think things have like I don't know about exploded, but they've they've got much bigger. There's a lot more companies out there, and the the state of the games industry in terms of how much we're making globally is is recognized at least. And how about the educational accessibility? Because when I was um, looking out for, because I fell in love in making games and making worlds, like in eighth grade, like what seven years ago or eight years ago or something. Um, I didn't know if I like everyone was talking about like becoming a doctor or like a businessman or something like that. I didn't know you actually could get a, a degree in like game design. It was just like programming and game equals to programming. Like that was the only message I got when I was looking for education. But I found Norov, which provides this amazing course of like a bachelor degree in like uh, interactive media. Do you feel like the educational like system becoming more apparent for new students that are so passionate about making games? I think that is a prop there is probably a, a large growth of of game specific courses um you know much like there is online with with tutorials and things like that as well I, I think before mm -hmm. you probably started with us there were still quite a few in the UK um that I was aware of uh I think almost every city probably had some element of a games course um mm. so they've always been about but it, it is getting bigger and also more specialized as well um there's yeah. quite a few courses in uh one of the places that i'm i'm uh talking to at the moment for different reasons and they have about six masters that are all game specific mm. um, which is yeah. quite fascinating because at that point they kind of collide but yeah all right all right that's fantastic um let's go back to your like career and all that like tell us a bit about your like where your career started because you mentioned your education and like you started off in arts and film and grow up like saw the passion for game development and actually did your like project about uh, like taught yourself coding like can you tell like i heard from you that one of the first job you got using your modeling skills was making a, a tool for surgery actually can you tell us a little bit about that and how that came to be? Sure, I'll, I'll do the surgery one first and I'll go back to, to the other stuff after. Um, so yeah, the surgery one was um, while I was uh, incubating um, in Ravensbourne. So after becoming, a, after finishing with a student, I guess I should do that first actually. So while I was um, a student in, I think the second year, I started teaching on the course. Um, yeah. And I, I, think, I think that's how it happened. Um, or I started teaching short courses. And then mm -hmm. in the third year or just afterwards, um, that's when I started teaching back on the course properly. And when graduating, I was offered a space in their incubation. So it's basically a floor in the building where companies come in and mm -hmm. like, you know, between two or three people can set up a company and, and sit there and kind of access mm -hmm. students or each other. So it was a good kind of like melting pot of stuff going on. Like, like entrepreneur like yeah, station. Exactly. Like yeah. And, and they kind of float jobs between each other. You know, like, oh, I need someone to make a, I don't know, um, an intro title or a, a put subtitles on this. And, you know, the stuff that we, we would find particularly easy, but they might not. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I started doing that. I was going to make a game. It never got finished uh, because I got too busy because <laughs> all these people wanted random stuff. And it's just like that. That became my job, um, which is quite cool. Uh, one of those was this uh, modeling. So I was asked by... A surgeon. I was working with uh, another chap on a, a different uh, VR project, um, mm -hmm. and he had a friend who was a surgeon who wanted something 3D modeled. So it sounded like an interesting gig. And what it was was uh, I was given data, so like scan data of a. I can remember it quite clearly. A C2 vertebra, which is kind of like I guess up here, like top spine. I'm not great mm -hmm. with biology, but um, so it was a it was a sort of you know link in the spine and uh, it was cracked and what they need to do is they need to um, you know sort of take take away the flesh get a, a drill um, pop it angular and then go thirty degrees and drill and yeah. in drilling that you've got um, two things you need to avoid there's the spinal fluid I believe and some other um, element I think it's just veins or something similar. Cord, I can't yeah, nerves, <laughs> which will basically kill the patient or make them, you know, 
um, disabled in some way. And you've got an eight millimeter gap in order to get that right mm -hmm. and a four millimeter drill bit. So there's there's not much margin for error. And this, I guess, is why when I realized that doctors give you, you know, percentage chances, this is a difficult one. So what they wanted to do was get this scan data of this uh, this bone. I would create the inverse of it so it would kind of fit on top. Mm -hmm. um, so I used, uh, we, we got the scan data out of some weird program um, and uh, put it into ZBrush. And I basically sort of Boolean something else from it to create the inverse and then made a handle and made a straw. And the straw was for the, the drill to go down because we'd you know, calculated where it wouldn't hit. And so you would, in theory, then print this out, open the patient in, in an operating theater, place it on them, and it would fit neatly onto the, the bone mm -hmm. because it's been taken from their scan data. It's personal to them. And then you drill down the straw. Yeah, so you'd be able to, yeah. to you know, successfully do the operation. Um, it didn't take off for, I think, insurance reasons, mm -hmm. because there's that big question of, you know, if it screws up, who's to blame? Is yeah. it the person ordering the tool? Is it me making the tool? Is it them using the tool? And then so there's there's so many different issues. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it was but a fascinating uh, job. But it's like really interesting if I like. If you delve a little bit in, into like the, the game industry in general, like people think we are only about making games, right? But acquiring these skill sets, we can actually help other industries with our technology. Like um, one of the courses we did, we, me and Marcus, on the in the second year, uh, we helped uh, the digital forensic apartment, and we like redid a three D environment for the students to they uh, so they can like practice their abilities in like detecting evidence and like finding out digital things and like how to extract and like how to become better at finding evidence it's like really interesting how the game industry is like g going into other like departments of like um work environments like you working with like this surgeon, he like used your modeling skills, right? Yeah, I'm I'm so glad you feel that because uh, sometimes we we design these things up and we go well, well, yes, we can look into these different places, we can get these different people in and, and different industries, and the students we think in our minds turn around and go, yeah, but I want to make an FPS, you know, I, <laughs> I want to do. Something. Yeah. Um, like, uh, so it's good. Was... It's it's refreshing that you you take that on. Like mm -hmm. I I was like uh, talking to my. My girlfriend, she's like a medical student, and we were actually talking about like, how can we like, how can we like, can we make a game that maybe helps other people in a medical way? Like, for example, like making a game that uh, like helps you, uh, reminds you to like run or something like in the gym, maybe a flappy bird on the like the bench bar or something like that, or running, that can maybe like um help someone exercise you know but i would need maybe a neutral uh, some some like uh, is that something to, you're interested yeah. in Trousty? uh it's one one of many things i'm interested yeah, no, in it's I good. Am, like, I, i've got in something love. for you then at the end of this remember, <laughs> no, and I'll, right. uh, I'll hook you up with something <laughs> um yeah where, when i uh, finished uh, i went into this incubation thing with lots of other weird and wonderful companies mm -hmm. um uh, I guess, what's on my CV? I guess um, during uh, study, I, I had a few good highlights. We worked with um, I worked with a company that was tied to one of the Sony games for a little bit. It was just interning yeah. on, um, so, you know, Sony produces a producer game, and then they they contact it. I think in this case, it was at least three different companies to, to fill in bits. Um, mm -hmm. One in Asia somewhere, and, and I think two in the UK. Um, so I interned for one of those companies for a little while, working on Killzone mercenaries for the Vita. Mm, yeah. um, did a few tests with them, but then they cannibalized the entire team and, and <laughs> poached them and put them in house, which was nice for them. Um, <laughs> and then I think before that, I, I did a Monty Python animation. That was quite cool. Yeah. It was quite fun. <laughs> um, we were working on a liar's autobiography, if you guys have seen that. Probably not. It's very uh, <laughs> niche. Um, but yeah, I, so... After incubating, um, what did I do? I started teaching um, for Ravensbourne. 
and then came over here to to do some bits and pieces and in between worked at uh, Shilden, the the local theatre here. I mean, were you oh. a, a lecturer, a senior lecturer at Ravenborn University? We did some background yeah. checks. <laughs> yeah, I was. Yeah, I managed to swing that. Um, so I went straight into senior lecturer without having done anything before other than <laughs> short courses. Um, purely for uh, political reasons, it was good. How, how, like, did you just, like, turn up to the university was like, ah, I know things. Uh, people should listen to me, actually. Well, I did the course that I taught on. So while doing the course and, and teaching back on it, you know, in, in bits, uh, I think mm -hmm. the, the lead there, um, the, the course leader might have recognized that, you know, I can, I can, I can put this back or I'm interested in teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, like you mentioned, uh, you worked, uh, like as an intern in like different game companies. Um, what is like one of the most unique projects that you have like experienced in the industry? Would you say, do you have any specific, like, I think that the, the surgery one is pretty. Surgery one's good. Yeah. That is like different from like, I worked at a triple A company. Like you said, I worked for a surgeon, a surgeon. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's more along the lines of that than actual proper big companies. I've done a lot of very small, weird and wonderful stuff. Um, I mean, one of the earliest projects that I can remember, but which was the weirdest, I think, was making mm -hmm. a product. It was a, it was, I think, initially a student product that um, they'd done very well with, and then they wanted to start taking it to market. So they were mm -hmm. making 3D mock-ups of it. And that, that's where I came in, um, in mm -hmm. order to get it uh, manufactured and then, and then, you know, packaged, sold, etc. And the weird thing about that was working in the university's library, um, looking up reference images of penises in order to make uh, a brand called Cock Sticks, which were chopsticks of penises, um, was very, very odd. <laughs> wow. Uh, that was a good one. Uh, what else did I do? There was uh, the, the other end of the scale, I guess, I hope. Um, is the uh, we did an AR project with the uh, suffragettes, if you know the the kind of um, uh, women's yeah. rights movement in the UK, um, yeah. and it was a walk around tour of uh, the suffragettes using uh, GPS phones and uh, AR you know models and animations over mm -hmm. the places where events took place around London. So mm -hmm. historical like projects. Yeah, but with a little bit of fantasy esque to them, because you know we would. Uh, at that point, I was younger, and we just made models and blimps and signs and stuff. <laughs> uh, wow, I I'm, I'm just like speechless, like imagining you Joshua, like in like a school library somewhere and like researching. I found the corner. It wasn't in the middle of the. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and how did like if you got like some. Uh, a like question from your mates, like down at the pub, like, oh, what have you been like up to the last couple of weeks? Um, I think like, some of them started to say, don't show me that again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, uh, you told us you were studying. Um, um, I, I like I, I did some research behind you, not like really in depth, but when I like search up like you at Norof, like what kind of teacher you are, um, they state that you're the study program, like you mentioned. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what these programs are that you're the study leader at, like how they sure. go and what? So we currently have two programs. Um, but it's, it's kind of one program, but two degrees. Um, so interactive mm -hmm. media being the program. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have games and animation uh, as the degrees underneath that. Uh, it's a bit of a weird mm -hmm. system. Um, is a and and like how do you organize these two like animation and games like how like it must have been like so much effort on like finding solution how this is going to work and all that like how, how do we like make the animation work with the games yeah i mean it, it's quite historical at the point that i came in um mm -hmm. to start teaching as a lecturer um things were not in the best of places. It was a very strange course. Mm -hmm. um, it's very similar to the course we have now, but you know, in name only, I guess. Um, but what was being taught at that point wasn't, I don't think, what was intended at the beginning. Yeah. 
Um, and so we kind of had to pick it up and, and think, how are we going to manage the, the the common courses that animation mm -hmm. and games both share and come together in doing, um, and mm -hmm. the specialized courses, and, and kind of fixing both sides. Um, so me, me and a colleague kind of got together and, and split it. So I took the games courses, another colleague took the animation courses, and we kind of, you know, um, picked an identity for them or a couple of outputs for them. Because mm -hmm. um, like when you are like searching for being uh, animation student or like want to go into animations or going into game development, it's like clear that these two job titles or like degrees can work together, of course, making animation for games or making animation for Disney. But it's like if you only want to do like animation for Disney, you know, or like for a Mickey Mouse movie or Pixar or something, you aren't looking for game development in essence like uh, you're not so, so that's why you'll find that the common courses don't really focus i think other than one maybe mm -hmm. don't really focus on games mm -hmm. at all that the link between the two isn't really used that much it's more mm -hmm. that the, the content of those common courses is shared for almost any artist but maybe a technical artist um uh, an example of that would be i guess your narrative course yeah because you you need to understand how to tell a story and how to you know understand the audience and the perceptions of them um no matter whether you make an animation or whether you're you're focusing on games uh i have some small problem here my <laughs> mouse is out of batteries so i need to like change it while you do that i'll ask a question um what kind of uh, courses do you teach uh, i mean you're also a teacher as well as the leader yeah um i think i've taught since i started I think I've taught almost every course. I think there's only two that I can think of that I haven't done. And that's probably animation two and three. I don't think I've taught those. Okay. Um, but I, I, I kind of started to specialize in games more. Um, and I, I think it's just because it's one of my interests. So it's, it's more that I fuel myself more with games than I do animation. Um, and I think that's, that's probably why I, I put more into those. Uh, and at the moment, it's become the first year. It was the first year and the third year was my my baby courses, the ones I can't let go. Um, now it's just the first year because I've let go of one of them and it wasn't easy. Um, and I'm now on uh, yeah board game design with gameplay mm. um, and game assets one. All right, all right. Are you still uh, are you still teaching like PPL gameplay or uh, like? Are you are you one in uh, are you in charge of PPL right right now? I'm helping out with PPL this next year. Who, so someone who, else is uh, taking over. Did you change the name of uh, gameplay to board board game? No, we just it's gameplay. Right. It's gameplay. <laughs> I, uh, in my mind, like um, I, you are one of the teachers. I feel like like had as the least amount of time because you're the like program leader so i feel like you're always busy like keeping everything in order and like um planning ahead and organizing things like do you have like do you have any time for like passion projects or anything like that yes I, you've actually mentioned one of them in your uh your question brief you sent me <laughs> um but yeah i do have passion projects i've been working on i've got um, I started a while ago doing some illustrations, but I find it hard to get into the, the zone for that because they're quite, um, they're a bit weird. I have a weird style of drawing when I want to, um, <laughs> but I, I need to get into that. Uh, and then a space game as well. I, I um, was playing, I think, Battlefield, Battlefront, Star Wars thing. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah and there's an X-Wing section. Old one, and, or the or old one or the new one? Uh, the new one. Um, the old one was fine. <laughs> the new <laughs> one, however, um, the, there was an X-Wing part and the controls in it just felt horrible. And I was, I, I only played co-op games with a couple of friends now. Um, mm -hmm. And I was explaining, you know, or we were all lamenting these, these controls and, and not enjoying it. And I was like, I can do better than this. I'll do better than this tomorrow. And I started <laughs> scripting something up um, and it was horrifically good fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so I just really enjoyed it, and I, I made a, a system where I was sort of, you know, pushing around a, a spacecraft and, and being able to control it the way I wanted to, and mm -hmm. it's really enjoyable. And then that's kind of kicked me off to continue making it and to, to try and you know create systems around it to make a full game. Do do all teachers have like passion projects? 
Like uh, we yeah. met, we talked to Diego like um, earlier in the last episode, and he is like working on this like science like brain waves Oculus thing, like crazy technology, and you working on on your like fly game and like beating EA Star Wars Battlefront flight mechanics. Do you, like? Do we know of any other project, passion projects like people working yeah, on? Yeah, I know that Eric is uh, Eric, Eric Hammer um, is making a, uh, a a tabletop game, which is quite good. Marcus knows about this, do you? No, <laughs> no. Okay, um, yeah, which is quite interesting. Um, so, kind of derailing some of the D and D rules to to make something a bit fresher. Eric Hammer is the animation, like yeah. Uh, is he is he like the lead animation teacher there? Uh, no, we've only got one lead. So we, historically, we only had one program leader, and then mm-hmm. recently, last year, um, when I took over as program leader, they also made a new job title of head of the the department because we've only got one program and one department. It's kind mm-hmm. of both roles. Um, so, so you work really close with all the animation like teachers and all the game teachers, of course. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm the line manager, I guess. And like being the head of department, uh, do you only teach? Like you help? You mentioned helping out with the PPL, and you like you teach gameplay, which is a board game, board game like course and a game as it's. Is there any help further like courses that you teach, or do you like allow so others? What I'm trying to do now is. Um... All the staff members have uh, up to five courses to teach is is my kind Mm -hmm. of soft limit for everyone. Um, I can really only manage about two as well as then get to all the meetings Mm -hmm. and everything else I have to to add to my days now. Um, Mm -hmm. It was a lot easier being a lecturer. (laughs) Uh, uh, So you um... you only... I heard that you, uh, you told us. I, I don't know if you told us or if uh, maybe Eric told us, but uh, it doesn't get easier, but you get better at it. Yeah, I think so, or I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> like um, when I like, you were the first teacher I like. You got introduced at Norov, and what better course? Like we have been talking about, briefly about the course PPL, and that is the first course that everyone participated in, right? Um, can you tell us a little bit about that specific course? Because I, I personally love it, and yeah. like some would argue against it because it's like a it has a variety. really rocky history because it used to be something entirely different. So the the course is problem based learning, mm-hmm. um, and previously a lot of people saw this as the kind of the introduction to university and not necessarily the introduction mm-hmm. to animation and games. Mm-hmm. Um, we saw a bit of a problem with that because we saw people coming in and go to a what is it four week writing course where they mm-hmm. don't get to do anything with the the subject they've chosen and I, I thought that was a bit of a shame um mm-hmm. kind of you know imagined that we're we're losing students because of that which isn't good mm-hmm. so uh we 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 changed it up in some terms, terms of uh, what to do and so looked at case studies so we're still writing we're still doing what we should mm-hmm. do with the course um but we we make sure that you actually you know go and play games or go and watch animations. Uh, talk I about actually, them. The, what I loved so much about like um, PPL was like I did a like whole research about like environmental storytelling, and it got me a lot right into the field of like looking at games, like different type of games, and like getting into into the game development zone because like. Before I got to this education, like tried to be a game developer, I always had a fun time of playing games, like figuring out things and ha- seeing patterns and how mechanics work and bounce off each other and all that. And when I like went to PPL, I was like, "Damn, I can like write ten thousand words or something like that only about my an- analysis," which I is not like I can never do that in any other. Like university here, at least at Iceland. So, like that was really fun to me to like delve deep to an analytical point of view. But some maybe don't like it. But it's a good, um, good startup to remind us you're like this is actually a university. We are not only playing games, but you actually 
are allowed to play games as long as you analyze them. So I'm I mean, it's really not even to... just down to because because we look at it. I think students do as well. We we look at it as an uh, we need to write because of academia. You know, you, mm-hmm. you're at university and therefore you need to understand writing. Um, yeah. I was I was talking about this with another uh, colleague in the UK today actually. Um, and writing's used in the industry. You go to a AAA company and you're going to document everything you do. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's actually a lot more useful in your job than you might think initially. Yeah. And also building like learning how to build skeletons and how to like creating the holy bible uh, the game design document and like it teaches you how to like structure your thoughts and like your thought pro- process and also like i mentioned uh, helps you understand the analysis of like things and how to research how to justify and like looking at different perspective of games like going behind the scene a little bit like how everyone does things right so I really love that, love that course. Um, I, know, I think people want to know um, what like academics you have studied. We mentioned that uh, early on. Um, so you, let me find another question. <laughs> uh, being experienced as you are, you must have some level of insight into the game industry, right? Where do you think the industry is heading with all of these AI tools available to us? Because in like um, in the second year, I was like, oh no, I don't know any coding or something like that, or I'm bad at texturing, maybe m- making terrain texture. We will ha- have all of these AI generated tools, but it's n- now more of uh, understanding them and like making like connecting the dots. Yeah, right. it really is that. It, it's about understanding what they can do for us. Um, but it's also not, at a surface level, people will probably think, and people might try to um, get something from an AI and then throw it straight into the game or throw it straight into whatever you know system or product that they've got. Um, mm-hmm. And I think it's a bit more than that. And the way that we're trying to introduce it um, is to use it as part of your production. Yeah, so yeah. the pre-production in terms of generating ideas, but also the production in terms of generating, you know, for, for a two D sense of like shapes, um, composition, and then you can start to edit it and work on top of that. Yeah, or even just use it as inspiration to then you know create your own stuff. I think that's mm-hmm. what it really should be, because mm-hmm. at a point there's going to be. Um, uh, I, th- I think it's like the, the the younger substance days where everyone was making the same kind of textures. You know, by just putting you know a color and some dirt on everything, and it all looks the same. Um, there's going to be a string of very, very similar products that are using AI. Mm-hmm. And of course, like you using AI in the coding sense, I would imagine like instead of like you always debugging or finding where the error lies, you can also just chuck it into an AI generator, and that uh, the AI tool could like pinpoint what is wrong with your code? Kind uh, of, yeah. So it's it's kind of a conversation, isn't it? I think it's more like having a colleague, chat, like ChatGPT, for yeah. example, um, that you can rubber duck stuff with because you still have to understand code mm-hmm. because you still mm-hmm. need to kind of debug it and see if it's right. Uh, I don't think it's really good enough for anyone to to generate code, chuck it into an engine, hit play and see what happens and then chuck it back and go, what's wrong with it? It's not working. Have I'm you, not sure how far they'd get with that. Have you seen you the... Have you seen the, the the guy making Flappy Bird, which is ChatGPT? Yeah. yeah, I think Eric Eric was discussing it a few days ago. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's interesting that it works, but that, that guy has an understanding of code. You know, he's, he <laughs> understands how it works. It would be interesting to see a layman try and approach that. You know, I want some Flappy Bird, make all the code for me. It's <laughs> not working. It's doing this. What's wrong with it? And then see how far they actually get without understanding what they're doing. Are you um, thinking of uh, having like a, an AI course maybe in the future? Uh, not not necessarily a course. Um, I think it should be part of something that looks at tools. Mm-hmm. So we we do have a course in the third year that looks at um, researching something advanced. It is kind of how I sell it, um, mm. and I think it could be part of that at will or at choice. In all of our, well, currently, because everything's quite new and and it's moving quite quickly, um, all we're doing at the moment is setting up some regulations in terms of, you know, what you should and shouldn't be doing with it. You know, we don't expect Mm -hmm. you, like like we just said, you know, uh, asking ChatGPT, can you write my essay for me and then copy paste it? Um, 
Ooh. But you can, of course, you know, say, can you can you fix the grammar in this this part, please? You know, and we come up with regulations of what you kind of can and can't do. That's what we're focusing on at the moment. I do that a lot with a uh, like I, I use. Um... I uh, I I used like an AI tool to like improve my work instead of doing the work for me, right? So like for my, for example, my project reports, uh, I'm really dyslexic and I'm from a foreign country. From like my English isn't perfect, so I struggle sometimes with the structure of sentences and grammar and syntax and punctuation and all that. And I often just write my text and go over the grammar and Grammarly or something like that, then I use AI tool to like proofread my thing and like point out something that may be better or add like improve my grammar. So it like communicates. I, I think that's a great like, perspective to, to try and understand like what it's doing. Yeah. yeah? So to, to, yeah. Get, to get chat GPT, for example, to teach you effectively. Yeah. It's a, it, it's a great perspective to have. Yeah, that that is like I did a similar thing with Studio uh, Studio Two, where uh, we are making a city builder game with a god perspective like view, and I had I never like uh, I I don't have a great experience with shaders and like creating a raw textures, so I used a AI generated tool to create textures for our terrain, but I like improved it myself or like i made some little tweaks here and there and i did um created normal maps within like photoshop and like i added small details to like to it would fit my project right so i'm yeah. using an ai tool to help my concept in my head like level design perspective and like to like translate the right image so i, mean, I think, that's, I think that's, a, that's a great approach yeah, yeah, I think using it to edit on top of, or again for you know inspiration to do stuff, is perfectly fine. Because I don't see that much of a difference between it. I mean, I know you can generate stuff from it, but not that, that much of a difference between a spell checker or, like you say, Grammarly as a service. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. to, to then take things a little bit further in terms of telling you exactly why it's wrong or where it's wrong. I like uh, I, I like uh, basically my ideology between between the. Uh, uh, how the AI should be used is like a bridge between my skill set and what I can't and what I can do. And because time is one of our greatest enemies in like game development, I feel like we're always running out of time, always crunch time and all of that. And I feel like if I can like spend my hours doing that I'm like great at and using AI to to cut some time here and there, and to improve my work, I think that is the right way to use AI tool. I, I think yeah. it would be like horrendous results if I would just check like everything at AI and like, oh, create a map for me, create sketches for me, create this, generate my whole PR. Like, that's not. I mean, as a going. student, absolutely. But I can see this happening in the industry of, yeah. uh, I think, product. Oh. Because I think that you know they've got problems there, but um, in terms of communicating between producers and artists, because mm -hmm. um, you guys have probably heard at some point, or your listeners have, of uh, uh, George Lucas and how he communicated how things should look for Star Wars on mm -hmm. napkins, and you know people had to understand these crappy little drawings and then mm -hmm. influence some form of art from it. Um, mm -hmm. And if there was some form of AI where you could actually generate something and go, actually, I like this, they can do that on them by themselves without involving artists and then say, mm -hmm. this is the kind of thing I want. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah. And then hopefully get a faster, more accurate product. I mean, yeah. <laughs> in, in regards to this, like uh, our tools develop, uh, they've, did, they've done so for the last 10 years. And especially now with AI, it's, it's drastically improving. Uh, but uh, do you think game development is even becoming easier or do you think it's actually becoming harder because of it? I, I mean, historically, it's, I think it's getting easier in terms of, well, the, the output, what you're putting stuff on. So, you know, back in the day, if you wanted to make something for the, the PlayStation 1 or the PlayStation 2, you'd need a dev kit. You need to contact Sony, you need to get the dev kit, you need to open it up, you need to have a PC next to it. And, um, so it's all, you know, fairly complex. Um, things are easier in that sense now. Uh, I say easier, you've still got mobile phones. And they're a mm -hmm. horrific thing to work with because you have to make them for like all the mobile phones. So they all have their own little things. There's probably mm -hmm. some bridge tools now though. Um, in terms of production, I, I mean, I saw the shift from substance 
So I, I, I probably use that as a, as a good example um, because, you know, back in the day, not too long ago, we were using Photoshop to, to create every single separate map type um, with, you know, a plethora of different plugins, mods, separate standalone applications to, to bake. Um, and then as soon as Substance Painter came along, uh, it, it's, it's all kind of done for you. But in, in a yeah. sense, it's just replacing that work with, okay, now we can concentrate on making better better textures and that that's what we have to do to get ahead is we we need mm -hmm. to focus more so it doesn't really make things easier it just makes things better it gives mm -hmm. us more control the product improves is the, polishing, mm. the uh, like improves the polishing phase so like like for example like with substance painter uh, back in the day like i hadn't used the like the old school ways of texturing I um so like I heard like baking textures could like take days sometimes, or like baking animations could like take days or rendering them, but now you can like do it in like a matter of minutes. Like yeah, that's ah. great. Uh, we we were doing some like five twelve or one k textures today with a student, and it was just we have to click bake and then wait wait you know thirty seconds twenty seconds for it to to finish. Um, and then you when I was doing textures, them. yeah, when I was doing it for my degree, um in when did i say 2013 yeah. um i think i can't remember um then i was in the library i was pressing bake in maya using mental ray and then i left and in about three hours later i would have my normal map or my ambient occlusion map but i'd have to do those separately and if that uh, map would like not work or you have, like it depends something. how much it doesn't work because it might go into photoshop and i might try and clean it manually rather than spend another three hours on so the the consistency of being able to click bake now and change a few settings and hit bake again it's just it, it's yeah Amazing. it's pretty rewarding so it's like um i would imagine the answer is like um the 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 um really planned work of being a game developer is like getting less and less like easier and easier like and the polishing and making things better and better and better is like getting like you have more time to do that and but it's not making it any easier to make a really good product. So it's like both in both ways, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, everyone's standard increases. So it's it's kind of trying to keep up with that, I guess. Yeah, Because mm -hmm. again, if you can spend two minutes in Substance Painter and get something that would have taken a day before, but that two minutes mm -hmm. is not going to be better than anyone else's. <laughs> and and like, how how would like AI, like, affects each and everyone's like roles because you mentioned like if you are coming up with like a concept of the get concept of a game instead of like writing on a napkin or being bad at drawing you can just maybe generate it in some way or another like wouldn't that affect the concept artist's role in a way or the like for example do we need as many coders because we if the ai will be like better and better and better can we like just make that maybe in the future write the code for us and have one like master coder that goes over things and proofreads or something like that. I mean, it depends how good this stuff gets, really, because um, I, I kind of liken it to using ChatGPT to create a story where you've mm -hmm. got a dream within a dream episode. Mm -hmm. And something like ChatGPT at the moment kind of forgets which dream is real. Um, and so understanding the path between uh, the start and the end of, of you know keeping track of everything is something that it can't currently do. And you need mm. human intervention in order to do that. When we're talking about code, it's a massive architecture of systems. Um, mm -hmm. So individual you know scripts, maybe it can you know generate some of it. But mm -hmm. the, the generation of that script isn't particularly difficult for a coder. Um, it's more that it's reminding you of syntax that the chat GPT can look up. Um, and then you need to check it to make sure it's correct. I don't think that's too much of an issue. It's kind of understanding why you're writing it and how it fits into your system. I can't see that yet being sophisticated enough uh, to not have human intervention. Mm -hmm. And I, I always that like human touch, like making a concept for a game and like um, pulling it through and finding out different mechanics and like. It, like basically imagination and all that and group effort. Well, exactly, because it... we're experienced, aren't we? we? We play loads of games, we understand what we've gone yeah. through and we want to make something that's potentially different. 
Um, yeah. If you ask now, ChatGPT, make me an original sounding game, it will be a massive cliche. I have tried this. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I've been asking it to make some stories for my uh, my, my uh, space simulator. And the first you know, 10 stories are just horrifically cliched because that's the kind of information that it's pulling from. That's, that's what's you know, on the internet or uh, available to it. Making anything that sounds more original or surprising or interesting is a challenge. So in essence, like uh, AI tool will be a good way to create maybe just the broad prototype concept skeleton for maybe games, but not yeah. should not be the thing that you heavily rely on. It should be that creates between like development partners, I guess. Well, this is why I mentioned you know making something as a conversation. So rather than me having to be a draftsman and, and explaining to you and drawing at the same time. You know, mm -hmm. I can I can look up this stuff quickly and then come to you with that and say this is kind of what I'm looking at. Let's analyze this together. Mm -hmm. And um, let's let's like take a step back for like a minute. And like we are like students at Norov, and we are talking about the industry and the AI tools affecting our roles and improving the game development journey. Right? How does like Norov prepare us for the game industry or the interactive media? interest in general like how how is the the degree structured for us to become what we seek out to be sure so in the first year um there's a lot of general skills that are taught so we we, we do a lot of introductions to all the different facets of, of game design i say almost mm -hmm. um we try and build upon those in the second year um we should probably put more emphasis on you guys specializing a little bit more, but we don't. Um, it's kind of for you to to find out where you want to go and why. Um, and then in the third year, it's for you to make a, a final project for your showreel. And we also have a, another course on um, industry skills or industry knowledge. So you go and mm -hmm. research uh, with our guidance, you know, how to get work. Um, you talk to John about uh, interview tactics and techniques um you know cvs and and where to apply and how to apply what not to do mm -hmm. we got a small introduction in that in like editing course in the second year with paul where he like taught us how to use premiere pro and like create a, a really good showreel like we should like pay attention when we are showcasing our work how it's important how is it like showcased to the employer We've actually had an update on some of that information, which is quite cool um, from a, a local Norwegian uh, game developer. Um, mm -hmm. and, and they were requesting that we do more breakdowns for our showreels. So not only just showing the work itself, but also the idea, the reference, some of the production assets. So you, you kind of have a, a why did you make this and how did you make this rather than Would just the final product. You got to pay that, extra for no. that. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't that like collide? Because a big thing, uh, I like I mentioned off screen, uh, like I am applying for an internship here in Iceland for a um, game design intern. And I was going o over with Diego, uh, my showreel, and he was like, it was really important to have it short and like just only, uh, around four minutes. And how would we like showcase our references and like game concept in that short amount of time? maybe prioritize a certain work or something like that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite new for us, this information, because it's, it's stuff that we like to see academically, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but we this is new for us in terms of, you know, this is what the companies want. When I was um, studying, I was told, you want to have your render and then a wireframe and then the amount of polys used, and that was it. Mm -hmm. Another employer, they get back to me and say, yeah, but what's it for? I was like, well, I made it as an environment for a showreel piece, but it's like, yeah, but what's it for? Like, what game are you making? Like, like what target is it? Um, you know, which which system is it going to be on? Have I thought about, which is implying, have I thought about the poly count versus, you know, is it going to mobile, for example? Um, I think what they're probably looking for, although again, this is new for us, is for you to showcase probably about three or four different good pieces. You say you've got four minutes, that sounds quite long. Um, but then to discuss it, so you can have the piece come up and then talk about, and then so this was this idea was uh, for a PlayStation 3 like game, uh, which had these mechanics, 
and I'll show you some background of you know how it started. These are some early sketches. Mm -hmm. I think they're probably looking for I don't know seconds for each small project report. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was also toying with the idea. Of you make one which is just the work, make another which is a breakdown of one of the best pieces. So they get an understanding that you you know your stuff. I feel like uh, you mentioned um, like how the the course or the degree is structured. Do you go over into like detail in like how we become a game developers basically? And you wanted to like um, you want us to like figure out our specialism. I actually. I love the approach you're going for, um, how you structured like the first year, the second year, the third year, because I, the first year I was just like figuring out like how everything works, like the software, Substance Painter, Photoshop, how to write and how to document and all that, and figuring out Unity and lighting, all that, some basic things. And in like second year, I really got like invested in like specializing myself, um, and to, particularly in like level design. Uh, and I am like every chance I get when I'm working on group project, I try to be the level designer. So I want to be that, and I always get the opportunity to be the level designer. And that same goes for those who want to be programmers. They always can like just I want to be a programmer. So having this group projects often push us to like wanting to specialize in some some areas right if you yeah. like have two coders on your project it's a it's an easy task to maybe split them up and do something like with their time and the maybe only thing everyone needs to do some th kind of asset creation but is that uh, and maybe someone wants to be a specialized texture art artist they can like take then all the assets and texture texture them so I think group work has pushed us, uh, from my perspective, pushed us into specialism, which I really like when when it comes to how the degree is built up, and it really gets us gets gets us like um, ready for the third year submission, which is great. Yeah, I mean that's a, that's effectively how it's 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 built. It's quite a classic kind of you know uh, progression model, I guess. Um, we're actually planning at the moment. It's quite an old course that we're mm -hmm. we're dealing with because we've we've kind of revamped as much as we can without having to get it reaccredited, which is mm -hmm. a, another big process. Um, and so what we're looking at doing actually is uh, making a new program to effectively replace it sometime in the future. And, and that's the kind of thought process that we're looking at now. Is like first year common. We do some basic skills. You choose at that point. You actually do make a choice in our in our new new uh, sketch that we're making um, mm -hmm. and then specialize into different pathways from there and then mm -hmm. again specialize even further as you say group work kind of directs that a lot uh, for those students that are like yeah, listening to this and are already in Norof, are you are you planning on having maybe some extra courses because from my personal personal experience i just love everything about like game development, I really want to learn more and more and more. Uh, and doing these like assignments with like project report and studio is like fantastic. But I also would like to learn even more from you guys from the teachers. Like for example, like learn a little bit about Unreal Engine 5, maybe a little bit um, like extra courses on like coding because I'm terrible at writing code. And I haven't gotten the proper maybe opportunity to be the main coder of some project because I've been focusing on level design. Uh, are you guys, is that a, maybe an idea that you would like to introduce maybe on Fridays or something, having actual courses like for those who are? I mean, it's tricky. Um, I guess, yeah, asking me, it's, it's tricky because um, what we do with trying to get the all of our staff teaching on, on you know, a regular amount of courses um, and then giving them more uh, yeah. is maybe problematic, but we, we have talked about having certain events. So, you know, we, we might have uh, like the game jams we were doing or the, the asset jams mm -hmm. we were doing online, um, mm -hmm. something similar to that, where we actually get a staff member involved to, to do something. Um, mm -hmm. I think Eric was mentioning some kind of creature um, modeling session. Mm -hmm. 
know, so we'd, and, uh, I think even a 3D printing one too. So you, you create some form of creature or or a D and D model or whatever you wanted, and then we we get it printed. So we have all those well, steps. So we have like those um, extra, what do you call them? Like challenges along the way for like extra work if you want to participate in course. Yeah, exactly. And it has to be optional. It has to be um, fairly short because we we do have a lot of work to do. So doing anything extra kind of costs us quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But yeah, mm -hmm. it is it is planned. And we have been doing a lot more this year than we have last, um, especially online. Because again, that's the other difficulty. If we, if we run something that's 3D printing based, what are you yeah. guys gonna do? You know, it's... I will just find my own three D printer here. Yeah, maybe maybe like you it. could get it sent off. You you have to pay some money to get someone printing it. But yes, talking about like three D printing and all that, I know that in one of your courses um, in gameplay that there was this prize of if you won the competition, you will get your um board game 3d printed or help to make it a real thing because we yeah. made it all virtual um i know from uh being in your class with you you have a great passion for board games and that is the course of like gameplay in like december we are all grouped up grouped up and make we should make our own board games with the help of photoshop and we learned that tool and how to use that effectively um do you have any favorite board games? I'm a huge board game uh, like fan, and I work at a board game store, so I have some experiences in it. Do you have any particular game yeah, that you exactly. really, really love? Just trying to point at things that are really far away. It looks like Sheriff in the background, is it? I don't know. I don't know. Lego heroic um, board games. World of Warcraft. <laughs> um, I think. I mean, I started absolutely loving um, uh, Smash Up. That's probably one of my favorite. Uh, really quick, easy games to to uh, get out. I, I kind of see. I like the analogy of um, dinner parties because again, yeah. it's a it's a communion thing, isn't it? So you have your starter, mm -hmm. you've got your main, and you've got your dessert, um, and you have different games that fit into those. So I'd see Smash Up as a really good starter because um, mm -hmm. the the rules are horrifically simplistic. Um, as as we went through yeah. with gameplay, um, I love how they print their rules and. Uh, the game has depth, so it, it keeps me interested. In, even though you know we've we played it hundreds of times, uh, so that was an early one that we really liked. Um, would fall in midway. Do uh, do you like some like, like really high Thor one game called maybe Concordia or Brass in Bucking, uh, Birmingham? One, I've not one tried game. Brass yet, but we're on Scythe at the moment. And we're yeah. loving that. Um, Scythe is very uh, intense. That is my personal favorite. It's like fantastic design, how all, all the systems like work together. And it's like absolutely fantastic, like from aesthetic point of view, from like how everything works is like 10 out of 10 game. I would recommend to everyone. Yeah, it's a try brass. Absolutely is that what you're saying? Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, know Scythe. Scythe is one Scythe, of, one yeah, of yeah. those. Scythe of is favorite. great. And we Every... we got the one of the expansions of the the ships. Um, the yeah. ship expansion is horrifically fun. Is it? Does it add a lot to the gameplay or like? It does. Experience? It speeds things up a lot, which is good because it, it starts off slow, Scythe, and then and then gets a little bit more intense. Yeah. But it never really reaches a, a very sort of fast pace. Uh, but the ships make that. I think. Mm -hmm. uh, do you like you? You teachers, like, how many are you? Like, uh, eight or ten teachers? Eight. Or I think like... eight include myself. Maybe, maybe do, seven. Do, how is that? Like, um, do you guys have a nice re relationship? Yeah, it's quite a tight team. Yeah. With each other, do you guys play board games? Who is the who is the the best at playing board games at you at all? Is the is it Diego? It's... Is he best at match up? No, it's me. Um, I, we, we, we were doing Scythe. Uh, we uh, we played it at John's place, and um, he's got a, a big fridge, and uh, we were we were putting sticky mm. notes of the scores up, um, and it got embarrassing at a point because we'd played it, I think, for like four sessions, and I won every single game in the, each of the sessions. So I had to start somehow losing. Um, yeah. Uh, so we we neutered one of the 
the factions. So I played the Russians, if you know, which is one of the most OP mm -hmm. factions, but without any of their special abilities, or without the special ability. <laughs> yeah, and that and that made me get my first loss. Is the Russians the red one? Yeah. Ah, uh, I actually I feel like the Russians are one of the weaker factor no. faction. They can I, get the factory maybe I'm not three playing turns. it right. Yeah. I I like love the yellow one. Uh, Ukraine, I think. Uh, is what is yeah. the? Yeah, Ukraine. That is like really OP, but because you get a discount of every cards. So you are telling us you are the best board game geek at the, at the office. I think so. It sounds terrible, like owning up to it. <laughs> I will mention this to John on the next podcast show. Oh, he'll confirm John, it. Is he... Will will he? Yeah, he will. <laughs> Nothing even a competition. <laughs> I, I have a question that is, it's kind of like about board games. Uh, I feel like I don't want to go too far out because I, I want to still be able to talk about board games a bit, but uh, board games are very uh, session designed usually, right? So you very rarely see a board game that has progression into another uh, session, um, except for like D&D &D or something. Um, in that regard, games like BRs, like uh, Battle Royales and uh, MOBAs, like League of Legends, uh, these games, I, I feel like when I play them and I play board games that are very complex, that I get the same kind of vibe. Uh, what do you think goes into like making board games and versus making some of the, I guess, matchmaking games that we have today? Yeah, it's interesting that you bring up those two examples because I guess that the thing that's really um, similar between them is the setup, the fact that you're always presented with the same effective chessboard um, and that it's your moves within it that that create the gameplay for you, that create that that sense of replayability. Yeah, yeah. Because that's, um, yeah, that's that's the major factor here. Like, I feel like I can play some of these games over and over for hours and hours. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in terms of the progression, though, you've got that, that whole form of other games, which are, are fairly interesting, uh, the legacy. Um, games which where you you know open envelopes that you only use in play once and you put stickers down and write on stuff and tear stuff up and, you know and <laughs> you can level up maybe or depending on the game um those are quite interesting but they are very expensive because you you, you tear it up and play it five times and then it goes in the bin effectively <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's not great for the environment and and how how um because you're like of course teach the gameplay course and is it, um what is like what is that like what is the bridge between because it's of both games right we are playing something uh what is the reason and like the ideology behind uh, teaching um our students about the thought process of making something simple as board games because it's yeah. it's more in front of us right um and more maybe easier to understand how to create readability no, yeah readability how to understand game loops game mechanics like and create systems i felt like when i was learning um gameplay that really opened my mind how we create rules mechanics and like create a basic construction of a game which we can like apply that theory or those theories later to our like game design like documents or like concepts right so yeah what is your like what is the reason for teaching us that uh, simple concept of board games yeah i mean you kind of explained it yourself but it, it, it is that that concept of um i mean in a, in a very simpler uh way it is taking out things like coding, taking out things like modeling, um, which generally take a long time, especially in the first year, um, and just focusing on creating something that um, is the sort of underlying effect of your decisions or your, your production uh, content. So for example, if you wanted to change a mechanic in a, in a, a 3D RPG game, um, you would have to reprogram something, turn off elements, maybe create new assets in order to test something out. Um, and that process takes quite a long time, whereas with the board game, you get to change a sentence and write a new rule, and that's it. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to test it still, but you need to test both, um, you know, the 3D one or the board game. Um, so that's kind of why we do it. We, we want to get across that 
underlying experience of, of how to make games before you start coding. And a lot of students come out of that, as, as I think you have, Tresha, as well with your, your mm -hmm. description earlier, um, completely having it kind of click at the end of like, right, I know why we did this now. Um, mm -hmm. It's also something, I mean, I'm heavily biased because I love board games and I really enjoy teaching it. Um, but it's also something quite a lot of universities do as well, is, is attempt to teach board games at least once um, to get across that sense of this is what makes a game fun. This is how to um, interact with other people or a different system if that other person is the computer. So they get a sense of how to communicate properly when it comes to coding or, or when it comes to you know asset design. Mm -hmm. I think it, I think it also helps uh, us to like form formulate and like um, put our like ideas on a paper and like test things out much easier easier yeah it's fast uh, and like and like understanding uh, it's so hard well like in the second year when we are creating in game assets too when we are creating our basically first game out of like um like um first game concept or like first game practically uh it's so hard for like eight weeks to have have one goal in the beginning and like foreseeing it to 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 the end but with the board games you like understand the thought process in much quicker way that we can like apply later when we are making a game which takes yeah. a lot longer time to Absolutely. test right which is like a fantastic way of teaching and also also um in like ludic studies uh, which is another course in the second year which i loved we go into like more theories uh, psychology and all that behind game development and like games playing and philosophy on all that and one of them is um, we learn better when we are doing something fun and not as like um stressful and making a board game and we can play it and analyze it and allow our friends to play it and test it and all that is actually a really fun experience and like helps us to, uh, translate these ideas across you know it's i mean another really element fun. of my design of it was to try and make research fun too and i know you've gone through pbl before you do that and you do i think mm -hmm. form and context where you, you learn modeling a little bit more but um mm -hmm. i wanted to make research more fun because it is because we're we're here to to make games you know or, yeah. or make animations and it's fun to watch them it's fun to play them so it, it, that's that's your research that's what you do so i think we spent mm -hmm. what was it at least three weeks just playing games you know yeah. either, either watching playthroughs or actually you know getting online with each other or physically to to play a game analyze I, it understand what's going on i remember i smashed you in small world I remember that <laughs> me, you, and Johan and Sigurd in a one lobby with you uh, and like playing Small World, and you didn't stand a chance. No, I think okay. maybe you're giving us some like teacher. You, you didn't want to ruin our ego or something, but I like I remember that really <laughs> clearly. I want I the underworld we're doing. Yeah, I think second one. Like, yeah. yeah. Um. Um. Do I have any more questions? Of course. Being a game designer, we are like talking about like making board games and all that. It often comes across the question: Do we still Small like world. games because we're old <laughs> and all that? Do we have? No, there's Marcus. Uh, like, like being a game designer, uh, we often. Like we are so locked into analyzing everything and researching and all that. Like, do we like playing games still? Like, do you like to play games still? As like, you, as you did. Like, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I definitely do. I mean, it's it's my escape at the moment. It's it's, it's what I do. Mm -hmm. um, but both to stay kind of on top of things, um, you know, to to mm -hmm. teach you guys, but also, uh, it, it's it's what I enjoy doing. It's why I do this a little bit. Um, but I think my my taste in games has shifted quite heavily because you know when I was probably more your age, I was playing things like Call of Duty and that kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So PvP esque or single players, um, and I, I don't really do those anymore. I, I'm more into co op games. Um, yeah. So again, a group of 
friends uh, just get together and we just burn through co-op games and we're slowly running out of our list at the moment of uh, just because we go through things quite quickly. Um, but yeah, Speaking I, I like that more. It's, there's, there's something that you get from doing a co-op game that's more of a sort of polite interaction. That that mm -hmm. competitive nature, I, I I have it to some degree, but I don't really want to sort of continually beat someone or or, or get beaten yeah. by someone, and then I don't find yeah. that an enjoyable evening, if that makes sense. Yeah, that, I I like when I play board games. I or like games and board games. I my view of like after actually starting at Norov, my view of like playing games has like drastically changed and shifted to more of an like subtle way of playing like i play more of a games like civilizations detroit become human narrative like narrative games and all maybe a less like fast paced than like everything everywhere all that like uh, because i think it's too tense for me now i, I just want to chill and hang out with my friends and talk about life i guess yeah and yes. what board games like i i still have the competitiveness like you mentioned um but like in board games i'm with my friends and we're like chilling but i want to win as well it's like a smirk <laughs> you know um so and i also lo love like analyzing games so like i, mean, I, I quite enjoy I, the four versus many format now as well that's that's quite fun I, again it's kind of like D D to some degree with a with a horrible dm but um yeah it, it, something like conan was quite a favorite for mm -hmm. a while as well you know, you have mm -hmm. one one DM who's kind of setting the game up and, and controlling all the monsters, but they're restricted. They, they're kind of playing to win. They are playing to win. Um, but then mm -hmm. you have the heroes having fun effectively with the, all their OP activities. Uh, what games do you like play or are playing now? Now, uh, I'm going through Lost Ark at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what else are we doing? Did you play that uh, uh, at launch as well? No. I I, I I don't know what we were playing at launch at that point. Uh, we just finished doing Conan Exiles, the the DLC. Uh, mm -hmm. Isle of Scepter, that was quite good. I, I quite enjoy the bugginess of it. It's It just makes the game a lot more relaxing to know that, you know, things aren't what they're meant to be. It's it's fun. Um, I keep Guild Wars fairly close, Guild Wars 2. It's quite fun. I quite like a lot of the traversal of that. The The, the ability to move is quite important, I think, in a lot of games. Um, or the sort of freedom of movement. Uh, what else have we gone through? I mean, we've done tons, but um, I think that's what I'm working on at the moment. I was doing Hogwarts for a little bit as well, but I haven't finished that yet. But again, so that's that's the single player. I don't have much motivation to to really mm -hmm. continue with it. I did the same with Red Dead 2, of, of starting the game, getting about you know 40 minutes into it, and then going, yeah, I'm done. Yeah, then, Dr... Yeah. Sorry, Matthews. Oh, I was just going to say uh, that. Um... Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> yeah. You go ahead. Um, uh, I was going to say that uh, in terms of uh, buying games, uh, I, I, I went from consoles over to like buying games mainly for PC for the reason that I want to play single player games with my friends. So I want to stream them on Discord. And that's something I can't do on a console unless I have uh, an extension. Uh, the third party uh, cable or something. Um, so, uh, have, have you tried that streaming on Discord to your friends? <laughs> uh, yeah, we did it a little bit. So, but again, two of us usually have the game at least, um, you know, two or three of us. And then the others might pop in and want to watch. And we, we stream that way and sort of, you know, chat about random stuff while we're doing it. Um, but yeah, we have talked about trying to do some streaming, but honestly, we're, we're running out of games. So, I'm not sure if there's going to be much length to that. We have to pretend it's the new time, first time playing stuff. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, uh, you were mentioning like you have a hard time um, finishing narrative games. Uh, Doctor Eric Geisling is one of our up and coming guests. He he mentioned that like only what thirteen or twenty percent of players like manage to finish the like whole narrative game and like have a, their attention span to like sit 100 hours or spend 100 hours on one like narrative game which is like not with your like friends or anything so that's a really interesting fact um well, I, mean, I, like, I, I kind of feel that i've done my time with it it's much like the pvp yeah. stuff um because I'd, I'd finished quite a lot when i was 
like I guess starting to teach as well, sort of you know the Witcher three and that kind of series, mm-hmm. um, and and very much back in the day, the Final Fantasy seven VII and nine, mm-hmm. and abs- just you know running through them um, mm-hmm. repeatedly. So yeah, I think I've kind of done my time with the narrative games if I want to. Um, mm-hmm. I think. Do you still I- do like research? Like do research games like purely for educational purposes? Just to be on the same level as your students. Yeah, we, we've done quite a few art games because um, I quite enjoy those. They, they're generally very short. Um, so things like I think it's called Plug and Play, um, mm-hmm. or yeah, and uh, that horribly uh, long title, the by Crows Crows, the uh, the cursed emerald and the tiger and Doctor Langistrov. Mm-hmm. Yes, I think, I think we had that in. Um... Uh, as as a, uh, I think either you or Diego showed it during. Uh, That's probably me. I quite year. like it. Yeah, it's a good one. Uh, it's a free Stanley parable, effectively. It's got similar mm-hmm. elements to it. Because one, uh, like uh, one of the like difficulties, I would presume, being a teacher teaching so much different students, like none of our, of your students play the exact the same game. Like um, Diego has talked about in one of his like lectures, like. Who here has played Caesar three? And no one's like, what game is that? <laughs> yeah, All right, I, I have that know? a lot in gameplay, especially. It's just like, yeah. who's, okay, so who's played Smash Up? Okay, no one, right? Okay, uh, and then someone's Ludo. played some obscure game that you know just came out or was kickstarted, and it's like, well, obviously, I don't really know what that is. So, and isn't it uh, so? You need to be like up to date in some way or another, like how everything is and, and how everything like what people are playing right how do you like do that do you like send messages to the students like hey what t- t- type of games are you guys playing or something like that i don't know really that's a good question because i the, the fact that i continue to play stuff and rinse through things even if at the moment they are only co-op kind of keeps me up to date with a couple of different genres um yeah. things that i definitely don't entertain at the moment are sports games um what but I, I I have done it in the past when I was a lot younger. I don't like sports. It doesn't interest me in terms of the 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 makeup of the sort of you know a team in a square. You know, at its very base, it's quite simple. Um, so yeah, the uh, sports games, racing games, is something that I've gone through as well in the past. Um, I feel like I've got enough knowledge of what's going on with a racing game that I don't <laughs> necessarily need to try anything too new unless something else interesting comes out soon. Um, mm-hmm. I think they've got quite bland recently. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, they used to be like destruction stuff and burnout. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and then arena bits and pieces with uh, yeah, fan of Rocket know. League. Yeah, something mayhem as well. I think. Yeah, Rocket League's interesting. I've not actually tried that. Um, <laughs> I guess that's more of just that, that's the two things I hate. I guess then isn't it the sports <laughs> game plus the racing game <laughs> in a square? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but no, I feel that I, I've, I've done enough different genres that I can understand and then support if you guys want to. And if there are specific games, and I do this quite regularly, if you if you mention games while we're while we're chatting, you'll see me maybe making notes, um, and I'll go and look them up later, or I'll actually look them up in class during a lecture, and we'll look at it together. Um, but, but yeah, great point. I, yeah. I, I I like um I've been doing my research like playing through different kind of genres just to understand um like what is going on basically. Uh so I'm not like only playing Civilization five and like only one genre of game or something like that. So I've been like testing out like more narrative games and all that. And I actually messaged you of my I played Spider Man, um the um, Spider-Man, what is that? Two two thousand eighteen uh, Spider-Man game, uh, yeah. the first one, and like I'm, I messaged you, and you really gave me a really good feedback on like uh, what your thoughts were on it. Um, yeah, because I played that. that one quite a lot when it came out. I loved it. I think I might have finished that one, and it, 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 that's the thing I like about Guild Wars too. It's that it's the the freedom of movement and the feel that you you have flow to your decisions. And would you say it's like important for us, like students and want to be like the people that are listening want to be like in into uh, go into the industry to be up to date with certain game titles and 
um, and like do their research while while playing maybe Detroit Human how they do things and like understand different genres and why people like them because I feel like talking to some of my friends they pretty much sometimes get locked in their echo chambers like oh everyone is playing Call of Duty but that is not the case like millions are playing I don't know League of Legends World of Warcraft Candy Crush and, yeah so there's so many different types of player types like it's massive now um and so would you say it's like um, important for us to understand the replayability the fun in different genres i think it's really up to you to, to decide where you want to go but maybe to also understand if you pick a certain genre you limit your options as to to who you're looking to work with um, or what mm -hmm. you're able to to understand. I think um, if you were to take my opinion of going, okay, I'm not going to play sports games or racing games. I've still got quite a lot open uh, within that. Um, yeah, I, I think it's good to broaden your horizons a little bit, um, but to also try and play those kind of keystone games that we we might mention yeah. in class as well. You know, like like you yeah. just mentioned and Stanley Parable and stuff. Um, because then, if you do go into the games industry and you you do get questioned or you know things are brought up where you need to add to the conversation you probably should yeah. be playing those kinds of games or have done mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for me yeah, i better. think it's more important because i need to know a little bit more breadth <laughs> yeah. to, to support all of you guys that choose different weird and wonderful stuff yeah i i just love like playing games uh like i'm done with a horror uh, genre like I played Until Dawn, which is like movie esque, like Telltale thing. Oh, not Telltale, like I don't know, like uh, Butterfly Effect <laughs> game. And I played like Outlast, the classic, and I played uh, Resident Evil and so on and so forth. And I was just looking how they do it and how they make things scary and like how they bring out the fear in different ways and how, the, uh, like in Until Dawn. And in Quarry, how they bring in that cinematic feeling and you are in a movie or something like that or in a TV show and gamifying it, actually. That is my my take on, like, being good at, um, or like, having a broad collection of what types of games you're playing because then you can, like, apply those uh, knowledge into your game design maybe in the future or ideas, maybe, yeah. like... Like Detroit Become Human had this cinematic feeling, but it's not a horror game. It's a completely different for like a really interesting way of playing it. Um, um, what is your like interest about like games in general and game development? Like, um, do you like the philosophy behind them, uh, creating games, or do you like the general making them? Do you like the practicality? I mean, I, the the meaning behind, I, I, I quite like it when, when things collide um, and, and kind of overlap for good reason. So it's, it's kind of what I talk to you guys in gameplay about. Um, you know, I think I use uh, the, the, the Sherwood Forest game, the Robin Hood game, mm -hmm. uh, Sheriff of Nottingham, there we go. Um, mm -hmm. As a good example where the your your interaction is um, visually and mechanically uh, communicated back to you, right? So if I'm pressing a button, I likely it should be pressing a button in the game as well, um, mm -hmm. rather than uh, if I'm using the mouse and suddenly buttons are pressed. That feels a bit like a weird disconnect. So I quite like the fact that there's a there's an input um, like conversation or, or translation between you as the player in the game. That's one of my interests. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, what else did that? Operation Tango was one that we were recently went through, which is a, I guess, a bit of an indie co-op game, which is quite fun, um, where you're hacking and you you match the keyboard in order to do hacking skills. You know, and, and on the screen, it's 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 actual code that's that's typed out for you, but you're you know you're writing nonsense. Um, it's quite fun, it's, but yeah, it, it, exactly like that. It's a really good example of um, your interaction affecting the game in a way that you'd expect. Uh, that feels good. <laughs> Um, I mean, something else that uh, I'm interested in uh, that I, I did in my master's was um, uh, procedural narrative. I know that AI is yeah. kind of you know taking this in an interesting direction in terms of the, the production capabilities of it, but I was looking at um, where we can use uh, procedurally generated uh, story content 
where it would be best used and where it might not be. Um, so things like your overarching story should, uh, personally, I think, be generally curated by someone. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you have a you have a, a character. You have a let's, let's let's go cliche. You've got a hero who's got amazing powers, and you you need to save the world. You know, and that that kind mm -hmm. of um, overarching content should be curated. But then there's the small elements that you get within narrative. Lots of different elements like uh, lore, NPCs. Um, you know, maybe even side quests that you can start generating and adjusting. Um, so I was looking at a system that would adjust what was talked about or talked to you in terms of greeting a shopkeeper, you know, something very small, um, mm -hmm. based upon what you had done previously. And so no sentence would ever be the same-ish, you know, over about mm -hmm. 50 uses or so. Um, and so every time you greeted the shopkeeper, you'd get some form of bark back, some form of greeting without with it having a connection to what you had done previously, uh, which I thought was fairly interesting. So it's kind of pushing that that boundary of having something that's more personalized. Um, regarding yeah. that, actually, have you seen the new um, NPC uh, town game? Uh, it's been uh, shuffling about on the internet. Which one? Is this the 3D one or the 2D top-down? The 2D top-down. Where yeah. there's like a city and the, yeah, yeah, where they all have little motivations and there are romances and yeah, 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 it's very cool, chat GPT driven and stuff. It's kind of yeah, interesting to a, see. There's a 3D one that um, brought to my attention today. Oh, you should check out that. It looks is it Skyrim even? I think it's probably in one of the Bethesda games. I think is it the one with the priest sitting by the lake? Uh. The one I saw was indoors, but I'm not sure. Maybe they've just got... New There's just so much going on right now. <laughs> yeah. The industry is moving so fast. It's like crazy. And it's also like fantastic to see like the AI tools and all this and Unreal Engine like being crazy, like Nanite and Lumen and all that. Um, but I, I was wondering, you as a teacher, and you've been like, what, teaching for... How many years? Six years now? No. Oh, 13, 10? 10. I can't remember. Yeah, 10. If we said oh. 20, 30. Yeah, I guess around there. What did, like, uh, did you expect when you were like doing your bachelor project? Did you expect you would be, become a teacher? Uh, I, I don't think in that year, no. Although I'd been teaching for like two years at that point, like short courses and things. Um, I didn't really expect to be a teacher quite so quickly, I don't think. I thought I'd probably go your... into a studio, but I, I was put off by going into studios, actually. They, it was quite interesting. So in London, they took us around to um, some of the, the film studios there, you know, so yeah. uh, like Double Negative, Frame Store and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and we got to see where they worked, and it was fantastic because it completely put me off wanting to work with Frame Store or Double Negative because they do really good work. They're amazing. They've got really intelligent mm -hmm. people working for them. Um, but it was just such a weird cave-like situation of you'd sit there for hours in the dark with you know a cup of noodle next to you and a, an energy drink, and that was it. Um, and that's not quite the environment I was after. <laughs> you wanted to be more interactive, or like more like like talking to people and maybe some light, yeah, and some <laughs> some, some <laughs> and you stuff like that. Like a little, little bit of life, yeah. Maybe a plant, maybe a clean water. So teaching does that, but it's also nice in that we've talked about, um, colleagues uh, have talked about the kind of jobs that we've done previously and how much we felt that, you know, we've added back to the community and stuff like that. And, and we've got those projects, you know, some of us, uh, those working in AAA, probably slightly less because it's, you know, I, I made levels for, again, we'll bring up like, I guess, Call of Duty or something. Um, it's not really giving that much back, but teaching as a whole, just every day, it's fantastic. I really enjoy doing this because it, it means that I get that sense of fulfillment. It's very selfish um, <laughs> in thinking about it that way, I guess. But I get that sense of fulfillment in terms of helping people every day. So yeah. it feels worthwhile. And educating, do you like when you see the like light in the like how how would you say um, light in the like, eyes? Um, Diego mentioned this like when yeah, let's see, like when Diego, I was mentioned, talking about this, like when some student come to him with a problem and he like mentions something to them and they figure out the the problem on their own after talking to Diego, Diego like, yes, I'll figure that out. He's like, 
that is fantastic to see the learning curve like and actually like like seeing students' progression is like fantastic feeling, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I see it quite a lot, but I I need to work on that because I need to. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm a problem solver. I love solving problems. So if you if you come to me with a problem, I'll probably come back to you with an answer instead of giving you some hints, um, which I should probably work at doing more, so you can figure it out for yourself. It's like ChatGPT. And uh, yeah, but it gives you well, it gives you the wrong answer. <laughs> improved how 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 um what is the like you mentioned giving something back to the community and of course um like teaching students like uh, first year students something like ppl and gameplay and all that like when you see those students like us next year um and you see their project and how much they are improved because you have seen our game as it's one models which are in my case, I'm not happy with them like now because I I've improved so much. Do you like be? Do you like see maybe someone's project and like, damn, that's really good. And I actually played a part in like teaching them. Yeah, that... I mean that's why I felt quite. Um, that's why I found it very difficult to give up Studio Three or the, you know, the Bachelor project um, in the third year because I absolutely loved supporting that because it, it meant that i could see that consistently get better um but every year every year i kind of made a list i didn't really make a list but there was a list in my head of where everyone was with their project basically and for the last two weeks that just got completely smashed um everyone just can like hit everything and they, they made so much work in that last two weeks that it surprised us um, one guy was making a racing game and, you know, there was a car, it was moving around, it had some, you know, spring physics. It was, it was looking pretty good, but the levels were a bit, they needed a lot of work. They needed more assets. And the last two weeks we had a full complete level, light lit, beautiful, um, a menu system, uh, some kind of cutscene coming in. It was fantastic. The, the amount of push in those last two weeks was surprising. So I, I like seeing that, um, that gives me a lot of sort of you know that, that fulfillment of seeing them really kind of uh, get better. And who 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 is the in charge of uh, Studio Three now? Uh, Paul. Paul. Oh, interesting, interesting. Um, and so is uh, being a teacher is in general just being uh, is fantastic. I presume, like having I mean, nice. I, love it. I think. Yeah, I, I think I always uh, describe it as being an easy job. I, I easy. maybe it's just because I find it easy to do. I don't know, um, but yeah, I really enjoy it. There's a there's a lot of good um, in in teaching. There's also a lot of challenges. Um, a lot we need to keep up with, but yeah, generally it's, one, it's good. I would imagine one of the challenges is to say goodbye to your students, like after teaching. It is. Um, yeah, I wasn't going to spoil this, but I might. Um, so at the end of the, every year, what I do is I, I I send out a message to each individual student um, oh. about working with them for the last three years. So you can look forward to those as well. That's usually a good sense of uh, fulfillment as well for for everyone involved. It's not just for me. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's so great to hear. That's like you said, so passionate about your work, actually. Um, I have like had teachers that just turn up and just say some meaningless things. Not at this school, at my like previous high school, that like sometimes they weren't like as committed to the cause, I guess. Um, but yeah, it's like, great to um, hear from each and every like I talk to every teacher at the school, and it's like fantastic to hear that you are on all on the same page to like provide help to each and everyone's students, you know. Um, I was wondering, um, uh, what is your, like, have you, you talked about you were intern at one of the companies in the beginning, you were talking about like, you're working at one studio. How is that? How did that felt feel like being an intern? Like, what did you do when like, did you like it? I did. It was it was interesting. Um, I, I mean, I was going through tests and looking through their work was was most of the work I was doing. I was about to start on assets before it finished. Um, yeah, I, I enjoyed the process. I enjoyed 
uh, you know, all the other people there talking to them. It was a quite a small company. It was a small project, probably about six mm -hmm. or seven people, I think. Um, mm -hmm. so it wasn't like a sort of you... know, big industry thing. I like uh, it's so it's um I have heard so many like new uh, seen so many news and rumors about the game industry. Uh, it's like on one hand it's like really hectic and cutthroat and abusive. Over in America, I hear a lot of that. Um, and but on on the other hand i also hear it's like fantastic like if you hit the right company it's like really fun and really engaging and all that like what is your take on on that like um and like do you have any pointers of like how to look for the right company like just searching news or yeah i mean i'd i'd for me i would start small i would go to to some smaller companies personally um rather than trying to fit into some some behemoth unless you're highly specialized in which case that's kind of where you should be going um they all have their cliques and then they all have their, their kind of you know working culture and attitude that you need to fit into which is perfectly fine because that's that's kind of yeah. whatever what any company is it's, it's what we have mm -hmm. here as well um but yeah it's uh it's a difficult question I, i've never experienced anything that's been negative in that sense um but again i've been part of smaller things um the companies here in norway though are particularly good in terms of culture mm -hmm. um so i i've not heard anything or seen anything that suggests they're as bad as some of the others that you're alluding to i won't mention any names <laughs> of course of course um uh, like um negativity at the workplace or bullying or abuse can be found in every industry i like in the movie industry industry in like teaching industry like everywhere you can see this form of like horrible behavior but that is maybe for another another time and another topic to discuss um, um i'm wondering I, yeah. I have a question actually uh so there this was something i heard from paul during uh, our editing course but it was that uh, usually people who work in the game industry or start working uh, with those kinds of tools end up in the film industry and then the film industry people actually end up in the tv show industry and <laughs> it's, it's kind of a weird match so uh what's your take on like going into different industries and stuff like that yeah it, it, you're completely right i mean it doesn't even have to be you know anything technical even you can go from you know history into games or animation you know it, it, it's all additive effectively as long as you can do the job um I think it just comes down to what you want to do and where you want to be. If you find, you know, a company or a, or a working method that you prefer, um, then that's great. Because again, we were talking much earlier about the, the health industry and others others you can go into, um, which might have a very different feeling and a very different culture to them. And if that's something that fits you, then that's that's great in order, in order to do that. You kind of have to be aware of doing it when you start applying to stuff. But yeah, yeah. Do do you think uh, do you think um, the like you're talking about there like going going into maybe the medical industry with your game like you modeling the surgery tool and all that um, like what is the limits like I like when how I look at it, it's like if I would start my own studio I think I could make like a like re how I can uh, phrase this like I think. If I like would pair up with some lawyers, I think I would could create some kind of a law teaching game. Of course, I think that is totally possible, or a medical 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 game that can teach medical students like the bone structure or like yeah. simulation and training. And, yeah, something like or like teach the air force or like what we learned in the ludic studies about like um, the French army playing like some military uh, games to like practice communication on the field like what is the limits because we are creating this virtual world and i sometimes called us like mini demigods because like we are <laughs> basically creating something out of nothing or like we are creating virtual ro worlds what is the limit well i mean it's defined by you isn't it you, you define what your limit is or or your um 
benefactor effectively so whether you're you're being paid by a company or you're funded to do some research um you define what that is uh in terms of what you can look for in in that scope it could be as you say some something with training it could be vr based you might even be using inputs that uh physically some kind of you know other ergonomic input mm -hmm. so if you're if you're training operations you might actually have you know some form of plastic or you know uh electronic body in front of you in order to actually do something with a screen as to what's happening um so yeah it's, it's completely up to you as to how you do this I, I was working with a company in in that incubation that were working with uh siemens um you know the quite large conglomerate um and they they produce uh turbines big massive engines in order to make cars um and these engines are huge they're like two floors high and we were making this for vr just to sell the product to potential investors. Um, and so all I was doing was you know, getting their CAD models and changing them up. But what they did was they tried to actually talk back to Siemens in order to the, then go, right, we've got this VR thing for you. you. You can obviously see all of your products. They work as they should. Why don't you give this to your engineers? They can use this VR to actually change and, and uh, adapt the, the machines themselves instead of going in on the, you know, the computers or the, the physical software you know mm -hmm. going up to the machine with buttons you know and they can control it in vr instead i was actually uh that's a pretty funny uh i was actually um uh talking to one of my architecture friends and he was like oh it would be interesting to create a game where we can like sell people houses and like i would create a vr environment and he would provide like the architectural paintings on the sketches and you could inside the game just change the building as you want it like have different modification modification on the building and you can change it and that's a really interesting project that i maybe will presume um i mean it was... sounds like a better version of house flipper if you've played mm -hmm. that uh, i'm wondering um what is your like uh, um What's your tip on like after graduation? Like, what is your take on that? Like, what to do? What is next? What is our next steps? I mean, it completely depends on what what you want to do or where where you want to be, um, and what's kind of sounds rude, but what state you're in in terms of being employable. Um, because this is something I, I try and get across to everyone at that point or or before. It's like everyone's journey is different. Going through mm -hmm. my background, for example, I I didn't go to my degree as soon as I could have done, um, and when I came out, I I wasn't you know I, I was doing random bits and pieces, which gives me a lot of good background in terms of what I'm doing now, but probably wouldn't mm -hmm. in terms of going straight into a games industry, um, mm -hmm. you know, taking pictures of uh, doorknobs, which was one job, um, <laughs> quite a lucrative job, but it was it was weird. Um, probably wouldn't really have helped that much, so everyone's journey is different so it's difficult to give you kind of a roadmap as to what to do it's more about self-reflection of understanding what you want um and so also like you sure that you go out there and you know talk to people so like um would you what would you say um they're like what what um what is available for students like um many are Compared with some of their degrees nowadays, that it's like maybe expensive. If you go to degree, you will just get one job, a desk job, or something like that. Um, like, what is the routes available to us? Because I can name a few of my head, like indie, lecturer, yeah. entrepreneur. You like with so much. I mean, I do. yeah, there's there's few of you, which is you know beneficial to some degree, but. I, I would ha I have a go at teaching for some of you, maybe, you know, you do a short course here or there, or, you know, there's, there's certain programs here in Norway that, that support that, um, mm -hmm. just to try your hand at it and see if, see if it's something that interests you. Uh, the others would probably go out to indie companies, talk to them, um, mm -hmm. try and go to events, you know, and, and be social to some degree. Networking is horrifically important. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, more so than having, you know, a fancy show reel on a web page. Uh, I think that's great. You can definitely get hits from that, but it, you, you'll be getting the same hits as everyone else globally um, mm -hmm. to some degree. So, yeah, I think making sure that you can actually connect with someone uh, would be good. Interning as well, having a look at internship offers.
and mm. two like um, and the and the podcast the one last question um could you tell us uh, the most notable places some of the students have gone right after graduating or even ended up in terms of both popularity or reputation? Okay, cool. In focus so, on the end spectrum and salary. In okay. Focus on I don't think I'll focus on salary, but um, <laughs> I've been here for, what, what did we say? It was eight years nearly. Um, Paul is going to be much better at this because he's got a lot more background to to being at Noroff. Um, we've had someone going to Pixar very early on when I started, um, which was a pretty good one. Um, we've got a, a recent candidate, I think in, I'd have to look this up, but he's um, working on Payday with, I think it's, is it Avalanche? Uh, um, it might be. I've heard both of those names a lot from one person. <laughs> yeah, Avalanche and Firaxis, I think, are the two that we're looking at. Um yeah, I'd have to look it up. Starbreeze. Hmm. Um, we've had people go to uh, Double Negative, um, which is film. Um, and then we've had a few people go over to Korea, do some um, 2D animation on things like Family Guy and stuff like that. Family Guy's in Korea? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they outsource quite a lot of stuff. <laughs> Surprising. Disney do too. Um, I don't know if we've got anyone in ILM at the moment. Um, I think we did a long time ago, but they've probably shifted since. Uh, and then a couple of uh, smaller games companies around around Norway. Um, there's one in Octo. Uh, some of them are teaching in the um, the esports um, course over at UIA. Mm -hmm. And oh, yeah. how about are some are some like starting indie? Um... Indie projects straight away after graduation? Yes, we have two that graduated, God, was it last year? I think so, um, that have started an indie project um, and they're, they're looking at getting funding for that. So they've been dipping in and out of other projects that, that we've had some research projects um, while, while working on their other game. And uh, thanks for uh, spending the time with us and talking about numerous questions and topics um thank you for listening and thank you for watching if you're on youtube have a nice day and yeah comment yeah. for any reviews i guess and apply to noroff <laughs> apply to